Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today we start a very special week dedicated to the Main Street Vegan Academy founded by Victoria Moran. And so to kick off the week, we have Victoria, one of my favorite plant-based people or people in general who happen to be plant-based on the show. And she's going to give a wonderful presentation of something she is passionate about and knows a lot about, which is Ayurveda. We're going to figure out how we can figure out our dosha. And she's going to tell us a little bit about the week ahead. Please welcome her to the show. It's always good to see my almost birthday twin. (laughs) Hey, Chef AJ. Always wonderful to be with you. Yeah, you are just so beloved. I mean, you're just every, you know, like if I think if you had pictures in the dictionary, you would be next to the word lovely. Oh, (laughs) that's very, and you would be next to the word energy. I energize everybody. No, that's true. I do. And that's why I was thinking of you. I do. I just do. I've always been this way. I have a lot. I feel like I am the energizer bunny. I think the plant-based diet makes it even easier, but I, I do feel like I've just always had a lot of energy for some reason. Well, you came to this earth with a job to do. And, and I think, you know, there's that expression about having a fire under a person and uh, you, you do, I think a lot of us do. And probably a lot of people listening are like, okay, I do, I do. Let me, let me get out and do it. Well, we are fire signs, both oh, of us, true. be apart. So yeah. first thing I want to know is how's thunder. In the case you guys don't know, Victoria has a pigeon. Yeah, rescue pigeon. Um, he's blind in one eye, so he has to be a, a companion pigeon. He's good. He's four years old now. And something that I learned that is interesting, if he were not blind and living with me, half half blind, and he lived out on the streets of New York City, his life expectancy would be 12 to 18 months because it's tough out there. For, for pigeons. It's hard to find food. You know, a lot of people think, oh, they're pigeons, they'll find something to eat. Well, not necessarily. There's slim pickings out there. And then there are dogs and humans and cars and poisons and all sorts of things. So they live 12 to 18 months. But in captivity, a terrible word, living in my home where he gets to have the run of the apartment every single day, he can live 20 to 21 years. That's so I, I'll need to have him in my will. I mean, I am thoroughly whole food plant-based and should hang around for a long time, but you know, you got to look out for, for your kids. <laughs> so you, I'll be looking out for thunder. I had no idea that what a difference of lifespan. Yeah. Yeah. Big difference. You have a, you have a, a, a dog too, right? I do. Forbes. He's just wonderful. His name is Forbes. Cause he's one of the 500 best dogs. <laughs> It's hilarious. Do the pigeon and the dog interact? And if they do, do they get along? Not very well. It, it's not hostile, but thunder pecks. And I think a lot of that is just bird nature, pigeon nature. But I also think that Forbes is a predator species in thunder's eyes. And so thunder needs to, uh, to be you know, the, the top animal. And he has picked, pecked Forbes a few times. And it makes me so sad because Forbes is so whatever the opposite of alpha dog is. You know, he's just like, somebody hurt me. Uh, So there's a little bit of acrimony. And oftentimes there is a closed door and my husband has one of them in one room and I'm with the other in another room, but it works. When you have a... a pigeon that's now being like a domesticated pet do you still put it to bed at night like you know how like Mm -hmm. regular birds you kind of cover them up so they know it's time to go to sleep yes and what's interesting is he does not like to be in his home in the daytime it's a cage but we we call it his home and so I'll put him in sometimes at midday if he wants to have some bird seed and he'll stay in for a second or two and have a couple of bites and then he just jumps right out of there. So it's not this whole idea of being confined. And it's really interesting with birds because the most important thing to a bird is flight as I understand it. And secondarily would be the flock. And he's without flight, he, he can't fly. He can fly a little bit, but you know, can't stay up. And, and then his flock are, two humans 
and a dog. <laughs> so he's, he's living a long life, but it's a life without some of those wonderful experiences that a bird uh, comes to earth to have. So I really want to do everything I can to be sure that he has a really good life. But at night, he does want to go in his little home and he expects to be covered up and he needs the lights turned off immediately after he's covered up, because if there's a light on and his covers on, that makes no sense to him. It's like this is some kind of dusk that I don't like. So he makes a lot of noise until it's perfectly dark. And then he's like <sighs> down for the night. So I'm learning so much. There's a wonderful coffee table book called A New York City Pigeon. And the man who wrote it is just fascinated by pigeons. It's really interesting how sometimes people get really interested in a particular animal. You know, sometimes it's bees or whatever it is. And this man's passion is pigeons. He's photographed different varieties of pigeons around the world because they're in almost every country. They're a very stalwart uh, kind of creature. But in this book, he talks about how amazing they are and how much they have going on cognitively that they can read mammograms and other medical tests that during World War II, it was considered to use pigeons instead of humans for guiding missiles. This was pre-computer because they were more accurate, but the army just couldn't get its collective head around employing pigeons. And that's probably good because I know that anytime animals are enlisted to do the work of humans, the animals get the short end of things. But I look at thunder sometimes and I think you could read a mammogram and guide a missile. And I couldn't do either one of those things. So I'm going to respect you extra. Oh, that's so cool. That is. Do you have any videos of him? Do you ever like include him in your work? Yeah, I videotape him sometimes when we go outside, especially we've got a courtyard. And so, um, yeah, I'll sometimes video him in, in the nature you know, New York City nature, you know, we have, we have a patch. <laughs> it's like, there's some nature. That's cool. Sid says a pigeon can read a mammogram. I learn something new on every episode. <laughs> That's funny. That is so funny. So this is the second time we're doing a special week devoted to Main Street Vegan Academy. In case somebody's unfamiliar with your wonderful creation of this brilliant academy, maybe you could talk a little bit about what it is, because isn't this June a special month for MS? It, it is. June is our 10th anniversary. So when I wrote the book, Main Street Vegan, that came out in 2012, that spawned all sorts of other things, the crowning achievement of which is Main Street Vegan Academy, training and certifying vegan lifestyle coaches and educators. But what we learned very early was even though we couldn't say coaches, educators, and entrepreneurs, because that's too long, that's what actually has happened. So after 33 classes and nearly 600 graduates from 32 countries on six continents, we have people who are uh, coaching and teaching, who are writing books, doing podcasts, working for animal rights and plant-based health uh, associations and, and companies, starting their own businesses, their own nonprofits, and among the businesses that we have are a vegan ice cream in Mexico City, vegan bodega in Philadelphia, vegan cowboy boots in Dallas, vegan food trucks in um, Columbia, Missouri, and on Long Island, and a vegan B&B &B in Tucson. So people are just doing all these incredible things. They come here, they get amazingly inspired because we have splendid speakers, presenters, and faculty, absolutely incredible people. We used to be in person in New York, and that was magical and wonderful for its time. But now that we're on Zoom, it's so much easier for people to come, and we can bring in instructors from all over everywhere. In fact, maybe one day you would be interested. Yeah, I would, I would love to, because I was going to gonna ask you, because with the pandemic, you had to convert to Zoom, but you're learning like yeah. that from Google that it's actually kind of a good thing. Well, I mean, we would love to hear from you on how to be out there with video, how to be out there in a way that communicates directly to people, because that's so important 
for, for everybody that's trying to spread the vegan movement, whether in a professional way or, or a, a volunteer way. So that'd be cool. Yeah. Do you have like a directory of everybody that's graduated and what they do so that people could like, just like look it up? Uh, you know, our directory is private just for graduates, but we are doing a new website. In fact, I think if we were talking two weeks later, people could go to the new website and, and we've got a listing and it's not comprehensive. It's certainly not everybody, but we have graduates listed who are authors, influencers, entrepreneurs, and in the nonprofit sector. So you just get an idea of, of what people are doing. And, you know, sometimes people show up for a course like this and, and they think, you know, I've always been in banking or I've always taught chemistry or whatever it is. What can I do that relates to veganism or, or plant-based living? And they find out that that thing that they've been spending their life on is the preparation for this next thing they want to do. And then, of course, not everybody wants to leave their profession and, and be a full-time professional vegan, but so many people have so many fascinating uh, little projects on the side uh, with their VLCE certification. And we're just proud of everybody. And because it's such a private program, because I'm so involved, the instructors are so involved, the connections with the class and, and the previous graduates is so close that it's really like a family. So I am always doing graduate school recommendations, job recommendations, all kinds of things for graduates. Cause my daughter has told me that she's not having kids. I will never be a grandmother. And I say, that's okay because I have 600 grandchildren. Some of them are my age, but that's all right. And they're everywhere doing all these cool, cool things, saving animals, making people healthier, helping ensure that we'll all have an earth. So, so it's cool. Do so if anybody's interested. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, do people sometimes come not knowing what they want to do? Oh, oh, very often. Very, very often. The woman that started the, the cowboy boot company, Kat Mendenhall, was in the fifth day of the program. This was when we were still in person. And we all noticed she was just intently taking notes in a way that she hadn't before. And then we realized, well, wait, she's not taking notes. She's drawing pictures. Those are pictures of boots. But in the five days of just all the input on vegan principles, communication principles, business principles, it all was kind of sinking in. And she knew that this was the direction in which she wanted to go. And now, of course, that we're over a period of, of weeks, uh, we're on weekend days via Zoom, people can really think about what they want to do next. And some people just come for enrichment and don't know that they're going to actually do anything. Just about everybody ends up doing something because <laughs> once you're inspired, there's no stopping you. You know, even though they weren't maybe part of the special week, we have had so many graduates on your show, just like, like Laura Armitage, just so many people, wonderful guests that also happen to be graduates. Yeah, Laura Armitage is just one. I mean, everybody's wonderful. I, I, there, I used to wonder, why is it that such a high percentage of people come to this course, which is excellent and superb, absolutely, but it's not like a four-year program or something, but then they go out and they do these absolutely amazing things. And it occurred to me, it's because they're amazing before they get here, just to kind of have the nerve to do something new and, and novel and, and then get together with our fabulous physicians, dietitians, chefs, publishers, uh, just experts in every field, then they, they go home knowing that they can do more than maybe they thought they could when they got here. Nice. Is, is the Ayurveda, which is something you're very interested in and going to talk about today, uh, something that you teach in the program? Well, thanks for asking. It is a mini, mini class. Um, something that I have learned over the years, and you know, when you've done something 33 times, you keep perfecting it. I think I've, I've reached the pinnacle of perfection, but I'll bet anything when I put together the next class, which is happening in October, I'll have found something to make it even better. But there are certain topics 
that are not de rigueur. It's not something that you absolutely need to know about to be an expert on the vegan lifestyle, but it's interesting. So for example, we have a, a mini class on vegan dogs. Not everybody, even vegans, wants their dogs to be plant-based. Some people do. So we have a canine nutritionist who comes on and teaches that class. It's not something that we expect people to be an expert in. It's a mini class. And that's what we do with Ayurveda. So the reason that Ayurveda is so helpful for vegan coaches is that it helps customize what they do to individuals because you know, and I know that one of the saddest things for us as committed plant-based vegans is you run into somebody who says, oh yeah, I did that. And you're like, and, and, and how wonderful was it? But they don't tell you how wonderful it was. They tell you, well, they felt something. They felt weak, they felt queasy, they felt, I don't know what they felt. But we wanna make sure that this is as excuse proof as possible. And, and the truth is we are somewhat different. I know Dr. McDougall has always been so good about saying, you know, you feed your horse what you feed a horse and you feed, you know, the um, pigs what pigs eat and humans eat what humans eat. And that's true, but humans are so complicated that sometimes we do need just a little bit of tweak for the unique constitution that we are. And this is something that Ayurveda offers. And when people know that, especially if you're a coach and you're working with others and you've got a way to kind of sense when somebody says, well, I didn't like that because I felt cold all the time, or I felt hot on the, all the time, or I didn't like that because I was tired and sleepy or because my digestion wasn't working. And you can just tweak it. You can still keep it exactly where where we want it to be in terms of food choices, but you can make it in such a way that it works for that individual. And then they think you're psychic. They think you're brilliant. They tell all their friends about you. <laughs> That's funny. It's cool. Yeah. I, 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 I love when you combine, you know, different things from different modalities like that. Well, I think it's important just because we want this to work. We want to live our best lives possible. And so any information that we can have to, to make that happen is, is going to be really great. I know you and I have talked before about the medical medium, and I, I use a lot of his stuff. I, I do the lemon water in the morning, which is also an Ayurvedic thing, interestingly enough. You know, I, I drink celery juice. I have wild blueberries every day of my life. And that's just information that came from that source. And there's other information from other places. I think sometimes people think, well, if I'm whole food, plant-based, no oil, does it mean I've joined a cult? Does it mean I can never take any input from anybody else? It's like, no, it doesn't mean that at all. It means you've got this dietary basis, just like if you're an ethical vegan, you have this moral basis and that's your bottom line, but it doesn't mean you can't add on. Right, right. That's so cool. What you've been vegan for over three decades now, I believe. Almost four. Yeah, yeah. 38 years. Oh my God. I'm not, I'm not too far ahead of you. What are some of the biggest changes you've seen in the movement? And in oh movement? my gosh. Uh, well, they're mostly fabulous. And, and there are a couple that are a little bit disturbing. So, you know, on, on the plus side, it's that it's so well known people at least recognize it. Sometimes I'm not thrilled with the way they recognize it because it's seen as a lifestyle choice. Like uh, you be vegan and I'll be a bird watcher and somebody else will do bowling because we just all make these choices. And I think people haven't gotten it in a very big way that this is a planet saving choice. This is something that just really needs to happen. And yet it's out there, people know how to pronounce it. And for, for people that really need uh, transitional foods and, and, and the packaged foods that resemble foods that they're used to, that's so easily available. Because when you and I went vegan, it was tough. You know, it was a, it was a big change for people that drink coffee and who like to have milk in their coffee. 
well, you just couldn't have milk in your coffee, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. And so now it's just, it's easy for people. And I think on, on the downside, we're big enough that, that we're having squabbles. It's like, well, I don't want to be called vegan because vegans eat junk food. Well, I, I think those whole food plant-based people are health elitists. And it's like, you know, even when you add everybody together who doesn't eat animal foods, we're still small. We're still way too small than we ought to be. So it takes all of us together. So, you know, let's just be nice and know that not everybody is going to think like us, but together we can save the planet. And as long as we've got a planet, we can then come together and talk about all the things we see differently. Nice. One time when we talked, you, you meant we were talking about Michael Moore, because he endorsed one of your books. Any uh, word on getting him more vegan? <laughs> no, bless his heart. I listened to his podcast yesterday and he's such a good person. He actually stopped eating red meat or four-footed animals after his own spiritual experience over a piece of bison. He was sitting in this fancy restaurant with this expensive entree and it was just like that Buffalo spoke to him and said, no, 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 you shouldn't be doing this. But it only went as far as four footed animals. So the poultry, the fish and, and the other things have, have stayed with him. And I know he's tried a few times. I, I ran into him, I don't know, maybe six or seven years ago. And um, uh, he and his friend who was with him were saying, yeah, yeah, we tried that. Boy, we ate some good food, but it's just so hard. And, and that's hard for me because here's somebody that has resources and, you know, can have a chef and, and whatever they need. I can see if there's somebody with a lot of children and multiple jobs and it's hard to make ends meet, you know, they could say it's hard. And they really need some help making this work because life is hard in a situation like that. So I don't know how far he's gone with it. He's lost a lot of weight. So I am assuming, because and he's had a lot of vegans around him too. Uh, a, a lot of vegans worked on his last film. So uh, he, he knows we're here and I'll, I'll bet he is more with us than uh, away from us at this point. And uh, just wish him well. I know, you know, for some people it's overnight and for some people it takes a long time. And it took me 12 years of, of being vegetarian before I made it to 100% vegan. So I want to give other people time for their process. You know, what's funny, Chef AJ, the more health vegan in me wants to give everybody time for their process. And the ethical vegan wants everybody to have changed yesterday. So they're kind of these two people in me going at each other. He would be so great to have on the team, though, because oh. you know, with his ability to make such compelling documentaries. Well, it could happen. <laughs> well, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Is he a kapha dosha? I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, though. Should we get into the dosha? Yeah, yeah I love I, so I people, love this. People topic. will know what we're talking about here. Okay, so this is actually uh, the second part of a presentation that I do uh, about Ayurveda. In the first part, I talk about general Ayurveda suggestions, which are just lovely. There is a, a wonderful book called the um, Ayurvedic Lifestyle Handbook. I believe I said that right, uh, by Dr. Sarah Kuchera, K-U-C-E-R-A beautiful little introduction to the whole idea that in Ayurveda, so much is not about what you do, but when you do it, just going to bed by 10 o'clock at night, getting up around 6, 6.30, this kind of thing that just gives you this wonderful sort of daily routine, having the biggest meal in the middle of the day. So those are some general ideas that apply to everybody. But one of the gifts of Ayurveda is how to customize. And that's what we're going to talk about now. And feel free, Chef AJ, if you have any 
questions or you know, it's not a question but you could you put it in a different mode because i'm oh, seeing oh i haven't i haven't moded it properly yeah it just that way apologies we, that's okay okay so let's see just like on slideshow Slide i think show, would be. play from start there we have it perfect okay cool so just a little bit of uh understanding of Ayurveda. It's an ancient Indian healing, medical, and lifestyle system. And what's so cool about it is it was established, some people say the earliest teachings were 5,000 years ago. I'm thinking 3,000 years ago is maybe a little bit safer to say. Either way, it's very old. And it came through these wise sages called rishis, and it grew up alongside yogi, yo yoga. And what's so interesting is that it's still a recognized medical system by the World Health Organization. So it gives you a way to help yourself. It's sort of like lifestyle medicine a couple thousand years before <laughs> lifestyle medicine. So a lot of people say, I looked at Ayurveda, but I don't want to do Ayurveda because they all have ghee and I'm a vegan or I'm a no oil person or whatever. It's like, you don't have to have ghee. The way I look at it, Chef AJ, is yes, in the ancient teachings, ghee, which is clarified butter, it's a big deal in Ayurveda because there's this, this cultural connection with the cow and the milk and the butter and whatnot. It doesn't mean you can't take all the other thousand wonderful suggestions and just not do that one. It's like every Catholic I know uses birth control. So they take everything except that one. And um, so many people are doing Ayurveda now and want to do it as, as uh, vegans that this company actually came up with a dairy-free ghee, but it's still a bunch of oil. So we don't want that. So we'll just do Ayurveda without it. So to understand um, the doshas, they're energies that, that circulate in, in the body and also in the mind. So we all have a dosha makeup. We can be predominantly one of these things and we have some of the other two. And some people are predominantly two of them and not so much a third. A few people, not so many, are kind of a balance of all three. And we'll talk about how to figure out what your very own dosha is. And I'll also connect you to a quiz if you wanna take a quiz uh, when we get off. But in addition to our being of dosha type, the seasons, the times of day, and the stages of our lives are also governed by one of these doshas. And we'll talk a little bit about that too. So the dosha body type, what's so important is that yours is perfect. And very often people don't wanna be something that they think is not societally acceptable. And we are getting away from some of that thing. Like when I was a teenager, you had to be skinny. You had to be skinny because Twiggy was skinny and the models was skinny. And, and you didn't have to, it, it wasn't, be yourself and be a healthy weight. It was, you have to be straight up and down skinny. And thank goodness that's not the way it is anymore. But still somebody like me who grew up when I did, when I look at these three types, it's like, I hope I'm this one. I hope I'm this one. I hope I'm this one. She's the thin one. Well, that's just silly. So you are perfect. Whatever your, your dosha is, it was established at conception and being in balance means that your doshas are operating in the exact percentages that they were at that time of conception. So unless you're out of balance, there's no way to get this wrong because your balance is the right one. And what happens when you're out of balance means that one of the doshas is too prevalent in your body. It's usually the one that's already prevalent Although sometimes it's vata dosha right here because skinny girl can have this very flighty energy that can even cause a pitta or a kapha to go out of balance. So we're gonna look at vata now. And I love this picture because Audrey and Fred are just classic vatas. 
I mean, that the long fingers, the long necks, that the typical dancer body type, that is pure vata. And vata in the five element theory is comprised of air and ether. So you get the sense of lightness and, and buoyancy, but maybe not being too well grounded to the earth. So vata governs movement and in balance, vatas are delightful. They're, they just, you've heard that term to light up a room. I mean, imagine when Audrey Hepburn was with us on earth, she would walk into a room and I'll bet anything, it would just light up like crazy. And vatas are, are creative and, and they have all of these innovative ideas, but out of balance. And it's really easy for vata to go out of balance because it's air and ether. There's nothing holding it down. And that's when vatas experience some of the negative aspects of vata, dry skin and hair, poor digestion, constipation, stiff joints, being afraid, being spacey. And interestingly enough, the vata time of life is over 50. So I am a vata pitta, meaning that I'm a lot of vata, but I don't look like Audrey Hepburn. <laughs> that's because I'm part pitta. And when I was younger, and pitta, which we're going to talk about next, is the kind of midlife, sort of um, early, mid-20s to about the time of menopause. That's pitta time. And so I didn't have dry hair or dry skin then. And I had no digestive problems, whatever. But then when I kind of got into my 60s, my digestion wasn't as good as it used to be. And I was still eating the same great food and all the fiber and all the stuff that I had been doing, but it just wasn't working so well for me at that point. And this is why I think it's so important for us as, as vegans and plant-based people to have an understanding of this because somebody who's not really committed to staying vegan would run into a digestive problem like that and say, oh, well, it just doesn't work for me anymore. They'll say it, it's too much fiber or, or whatever they'll say, and they'll go running back to the status quo. Well, we don't want that to happen. But if you understand that that's vata imbalance, you can take care of that stuff and stay with the kind of eating that is best for the body and for everybody on the planet. So to make vata happy, you want to be hydrated, warm, stay away from drafts. I remember my mom who was like me, she was vata pitta, but I didn't know that then. And she was always telling my stepfather, oh, get me away from that draft. Get me away from that blowing air. I can't stand it. And he was so lacking in understanding. It didn't make any sense to him why moving air should be such a problem for a person. But somebody without a balanced vata, it's a problem. You know, trust people when they tell you their little quirks. Vata needs a predictable schedule. They don't do well with a lot of travel. They don't do well with things like loud noises and violence, even on TV. My husband is a pitta. And before we knew a lot about this stuff, I was just in awe that he could watch what we call a guy movie with lots of shoot him up and he'd be fine. And I would just be agitated. I couldn't sleep. I was just disturbed. Well, that's because Vata is easily disturbed. <laughs> so when it comes to food, Vata likes warm, moist foods. Vata likes oatmeal, and, and especially when you make it all creamy, and maybe you use some non-dairy milk to cook your oatmeal, and you just put some wonderful sweet fruits in there, and you put some nuts in there because that little bit of fat is, is grounding for, for Vata. Vata likes hot tea. Vata likes, you know, chai kinds of, of drinks, warm milk at bedtime. All of these things are just very comforting. So if you think about comfort foods, mashed potatoes, I mean, the, the mashed potato recipe in Dr. Esselstyn's book, that wonderful mashed potato recipe that Ann Esselstyn does, so perfect for a vata because it's warm and it's soft and it goes down easy. So all these other things that you can read here are, are really great to keep a vata in balance. But that's only one of the doshas. The next one we're going to talk about is pitta. 
And Chef AJ, when you ask what I think you are, I think you're a Pitavata. And we have the Williams sisters here. And Serena looks to me like a pure Pitta. And the reason I say that is she's got all that muscle. In fact, she has so many muscles that you can find people online saying, does she use steroids? She's Pitta. Pitta can build muscle in a New York minute. So often we, we compete with one another and maybe a couple of friends will start going to the gym together and, and one will just you know bulk up or, or be all ripped in a short amount of time and the other person's doing the same workout and it's not happening for them. Well, a lot of that is body type. And then we have Venus over here who is probably Vata Pitta. So she's got muscle for sure. There's some Pitta going on with that woman, but she's also longer, leaner, and just has a little bit more Vata showing up. So Pitta people have what they call strong Agni. Agni is a Sanskrit word for digestive fire. And digestion is super important in Ayurveda. And the teaching is that you need to digest your food well because undigested food leads to disease, but you also need to digest your life well. So if you have an experience, whether we would call it a good one or a bad one, you need to digest that and assimilate it into experience. And you do that when you keep yourself balanced with some of these teachings. So uh, Pitta, when they're in balance, they are delightful. I am married to one. They're happy. They're really, really smart. They're quick. Their, their wit is, is just brilliant, sometimes biting and cutting, but really, really sharp. They're brave, they're ambitious. They can envision what they want to build. They can envision a corporation. They can envision the world as they want to see it and then set out to make that happen. But out of balance, you just don't want to be around them because they can get really, really angry and sometimes with reason and sometimes without, they get inflammatory kinds of conditions and diseases. Uh, white people who are Pitta, they're often, you know, the face turns red. They're, they're angry, they're upset. Uh, so skin eruptions, uh, acne rosacea, diarrhea, again, like eruptions uh, can happen without a balanced Pitta. And as we said before, midlife is the Pitta time because that's when we need all of this energy, all this very grounded earth energy to get out in the world, establish a profession, find a mate, create a home, raise children, prepare for retirement, all that stuff, all executive functioning, which Pitta is superb at. So some of the things to make Pitta happy are keeping the temperature down. And if you are in a relationship with somebody who always keeps the room too hot or too cold, it's probably because you guys have different doshas and you just have to figure out how that works. Like maybe you need one of those mattresses that lets one side be hot and one side be cold. Um, uh, pittas do well with kind of summer foods, like raw food works well for pitta because they have really great uh, digestion and you don't want anything that's gonna overheat a pitta. So not a lot of um, super, pungent spices, alcohol, caffeine. Um, pitta is a wet dosha, unlike vata that we just talked about. So they want, it's almost like, I sometimes think of pittas of, of any gender as being like the 1950s stereotype of the husband. You know, honey, I'm home, where's dinner? I expect dinner on the table at six o'clock because Pitta has this really powerful appetite. And if a meal is delayed, they get angry. It's like, I need my, my meal. And when they sit down to the meal, it's like they want solid food. What's this soupy, runny thing? I want food. <laughs> and certainly we can do that with whole food, plant-based eating and just kind of tweak it a little bit to make it work for that individual. So three meals a day, Ayurveda does like three meals a day in a peaceful atmosphere so that we're kind of cooling down the pitta and giving that person enough to eat. And now we come to kapha and we have some uh, famous uh, kapha 
people. And the kapha body type, if we think of, of vata as, as being thin and delicate, and we think of pitta as a kind of middle-sized but muscular, kapha is a little bit rounder. And so often people say, oh, I don't want to be kapha because you know, I, I don't want to gain weight. But it's not about gaining weight. It's about not trying to be that, that supermodel from the 1960s kind of body type, if that's not your nature. I just read an article today about people who are spending $1,300 a month on a weight loss medication that's actually a diabetes drug. And it can help supposedly morbidly obese people um, calm down their appetite and stuff like that. But a lot of people are taking it just to get off the last five to 10 pounds. But because the appetite comes back with a vengeance, if they stop taking it, these people are spending all this money and being on a drug long term to keep five to 10 pounds off. They'd be so much better with the five to 10 pounds. And that's what kapha is. Kapha is is never going to look like Audrey Hepburn without really heroic measures. And they don't need to. They're, they're just this kind of beautiful, sexy sort of, of body type that's not skinny, but is really healthy. Because we talked about vata being ether and air, very flighty, hard to keep grounded. Kapha is earth and water. So there's a certain heaviness there but that means stability. And it means that other than respiratory kinds of conditions, like we think of as kids getting and, and childhood is the kapha time of life or um, diseases or, or difficulties that can come from lack of exercise and, and just kind of being too still and quiet, which is kind of the kapha mothership, um, they, they tend to be really healthy. They just don't go out of balance easily. And they're also, they're just loving. I think of like the Italian grandmother, the, the friend that you could knock on the door in the middle of the night <clears throat> and you need their help and they won't even be mad about it. You know, they'll want to feed you and, you know, come on in. So um, they are the kindest people. Everybody needs some coffees in their life. Deepak Chopra once said that, the United States has a kapha shortage, that there are a lot more kapha people in India. And I find that interesting. So to bring out the best in kapha, it actually benefits from some stimulation. So you don't want to put vata when it's out of balance in one of these crazy exercise classes where the guy is screaming like a, a boot camp kind of thing. But kapha, that's actually good for because they need some, some stimulation. So the very spicy foods that wouldn't be good for pitta, uh, it can help kapha. It can help them get going. Ayurveda doesn't like caffeine, but for kapha, they're saying, yeah, you know, have some in the morning. It, it'll help you out. So just like we said, Vata needs a lot of stability, not a lot of travel. Kapha, go around the world, do adventure travel, go, go chase the um, habitat of, of the mountain gorillas, you know, whatever it takes to just have, have some change of scenery and, and some change of activity. And food wise, Kapha does well on a minimalist sort of diet, fruits, veggies, legumes, maybe not so many grains as pitta and, and, um, and vata, although a brown rice is good, quinoa is, is, is good. And because everything with kapha is so slow, the digestion is strong and steady, but it's slow. So they don't want to eat between meals so that the food from the last meal is digested before the next one comes in. So you can find your own, um, body type in a quiz. Uh, one that I like is on Deepak Chopra's website. You can just Google Deepak Chopra quiz and you'll find it. There's another one on a, a site called uh, Banyan Botanicals. And that is actually an online store uh, with Ayurvedic products, but you don't have to buy anything uh, to take the dosha quiz. 
But here is a way to remember and maybe get a sense of what dosha you think might be um, um, most active in, in your body right now and forever. I mean, your, your, your doshas don't change. The time of life changes and there's a little more kapha in childhood, pitta in midlife, vata in older age. But you, whether you are a vata, pitta, kapha, or whatever you are, pitta, kapha, vata, that is yours forever. That's like your DNA. So I have this envelope here, this letterhead from the IRS. It showed up, it's not a refund. And you see it in your mailbox and it's Friday evening. So whatever it is, you can't deal with it till Monday. You've got to sit with it over the weekend. You may just by looking at that letterhead on the screen, be feeling how you would feel if that was in your mailbox. So Vata in balance, it's going to be a little bit nervous. The stomach is going to have some butterflies maybe, but they'll take care of it. But out of balance, a vata who's been traveling a lot, drinking a lot of ice cold beverages, um, having other anxiety in life is going to be riddled with fear and anxiety. They're going to have a horrible, horrible weekend waiting to see what this is about. Then Pitta in balance is going to be a little bit perturbed. Because Pitta is pretty sure that they're right and that if something's wrong, it's somebody's fault. Uh, but they're going to be fine. They're just going to take care of it on Monday. It's all okay. But out of balance, they're going to be mad as hell. Whose fault is it? If they can't reach anybody at the IRS, they'll call their accountant and find out if it was their fault. So we want to keep these doshas in balance because there are great friends in balance and, and not our friends out of balance. Kapha in balance, no big deal. Kapha doesn't get very flustered. <laughs> but if it's out of balance, they'll just forget about it. They'll stick it on the desk with all the other stacks of stuff they haven't tended to and might let the thing go until it really does become serious. So I just want to talk a little bit. Did you have anything, Chef AJ? I feel like I've talked a long time. Oh, no, no, let me, I'm just listening intently and I, I see, see myself in so many things you're saying. And I'm, I'm going to check the chat to see if there's any questions. Oh, people are, are making comments that they loved your contribution to the Ultimate Weight Loss Bundle. Oh. You did a three series lectures and people are saying that. Um, Vata represents air, light and fluffy. This is when feeling anxious, more likely one is Vata dominant. There's a comment about that. Yes, very true. Nice. If you guys have questions, please put four question marks before. Yeah. So if nobody has one at the moment, I will just continue. Well, well because this is you know, this oh. is the question, but you can't okay. change your dosha, right? Because Annette mm -hmm. says, my dosha may have changed. I'm not so heavy anymore. No, uh, your dosha doesn't change because, and, and Chef AJ and I were talking about this earlier because we're, we're I, I know I'm a vata pitta and I say no, not just because of taking the quiz, but I've also seen many Ayurvedic doctors in my life and they can test your pulses. They look in your eyes, they look at your tongue. They know what your dosha is. So I am definitely Vata Pitta. We're assuming that Chef AJ is Pitta Vata. We were both very overweight earlier in our lives. We were still Vata Pitta and Pitta Vata. And we are that now. So a person can be any weight and be any dosha. It's just what you naturally tend to. So when I was losing weight long years ago, I never thought I would ever be slender because my whole life, I mean, I, I was overweight even as a child. So I just assumed that I had big bones and I was just someone who would always be, that. they'd say, well, you're just a big girl. And I thought I will always be a big girl. But when I lost the weight, I found out I have little tiny bones. <laughs> and when there's not excess weight on me, I happen to be a slender person. That's, that's the vata uh, in me coming out. But well, you know, when I was obese, nobody would have guessed me uh, to be a vata, although a good Ayurvedic doctor would have figured it out. So um, let's talk a little bit about the seasons, because in, in Ayurveda, 
there, there are really three seasons. I know we have four seasons, but Vata season is kind of late fall to early winter when the air is, is kind of dry and it's starting to get colder, but you're not in that dead of winter yet. And this is when a lot of people notice their skin kind of dry and flaky. Uh, they may feel constipated. It may be a little bit harder to sleep. They may feel a little bit spacey. And so these, these comforting things. So even if you're not Vata dominant, but if you feel any of these kinds of, of sensations or any of these kinds of symptoms, then you want to take care of your Vata because we all have Vata in us. So hot soup, wrapping up in a blanket, watching the funniest movie you've ever seen, hanging out with somebody you love. That's really, really helpful for a Vata at any time or anybody during Vata season. So Chef AJ, you were a comedian. What's the funniest movie you've ever seen? Oh my God, there's so <laughs> many. I, you know, I loved What's Up Doc a long time ago with Barbara <laughs> Streisand and Ryan O'Neill. I must've seen it seven times. Yes, I, yeah. I really liked, um, well, there were two and they came out about the same time in the eighties and I thought they were both so funny. One was big when um, uh, Tom Hanks turned into a little boy and, and one was big business. And that one's a little dated now, especially since so many people are working from home, but they were both so funny. So just, you can even go online and, and there are our listings of funniest movies of all time. And when you need to laugh, which we know creates endorphins and is really healthy for us anyway, that's a cool thing to do. So kapha season is from the coldest, darkest part of winter into spring. Now I know some people live in a climate like the one where Chef AJ was recently, where there's not a lot of climate change, but even there, there's a shift and you can, you can sense the difference when you start paying attention. It's not 100% the same um, all, all through the year. And during this, this time, this, you might feel sluggish, unmotivated, catch colds, gain weight. You know, people often say who live in places that have winter, like, oh, I gained the 10 pounds this, this winter. Not so much when you're whole food plant-based, but you know, a lot of people say that. Well, that's kind of your, your kapha being a predominant in the winter. And again, you want to stay warm. Vata and kapha are both cold doshas. And you want to get exercise. Just at this time of year when we're less interested in exercise is, is when we need it the most. Now, pitta, we're coming into pitta now, certainly uh, where I live in, in New York City. Summer never quite comes here as soon as I'm used to. I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. And by now it would be nice and warm every single day. It's a little bit spotty uh, in New York, but we're, we're getting there. And in this kind of season, we don't want to get that hot under the collar thing. Now, this is the time of year when, when there's more crime. There, there's just more unrest because heat does that to people. So you want cooling foods, the melons, peaches, cucumbers, salads, and, you know, make your magic banana ice cream, uh, peel and chop your frozen bananas that are, are nice and ripe and put them in the food processor and scrape down the sides, use a tiny bit of water if you need to, a little vanilla extract. And it's just like soft serve and is so wonderful. And that's the kind of thing that if a vata were to eat that in the winter and then go outside, I mean, it would cause no ends of problems. They would be so out of balance. But when it's hot and you're maybe eating dinner outside, that's just a perfect thing for anybody of any dosha. So that's how we use the seasons. And um, there's also seasoning. <laughs> I'm sorry, I love this picture because I just like the jars. I don't like that the salt is right there in front because we don't use very much salt, but if, if any. But you do get the idea here that all these wonderful seasonings, which we just know are so healing, so full of, of phytochemicals, so anti-inflammatory, uh, um, turmeric, and you kind of get a sense, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to skip ahead, um, that if you look at the spices for vata, um, they're, they're kind of grounding. You know, the idea of fennel, like fennel is a specific for digestion. You'll sometimes find a fennel seeds when you leave an Indian restaurant, 
just to chew some fennel seeds to help the food digest. Ginger, Vata just loves ginger. And then you get to Pitta, and these are kind of calming. You think about uh, cilantro, cardamom, mint, certainly cooling, cooling. And then kapha, warming and a little bit stimulating. We've got turmeric is, is well, turmeric's good for everybody, but um, specifically for kapha, fenugreek is, is bitter, mustard seeds, uh, and, and the chili peppers are, are gonna be stimulating and spicy. So these are just ways to kind of, of help your dosha as well as your general health with the spices. And these are a couple of um, Ayurvedic cookbooks that also happen to be vegan. Not all the recipes are oil-free, so you will have to watch out for those if, if you get one of these books, but they're wonderful ways to experiment with some Ayurvedic meals without having to say, what do I do about the ghee and, and the butter and whatnot, because uh, there are no animal products in these books. So enjoy. I'm going to stop sharing mm -hmm. and be back with my favorite chef. Nice. So if somebody wants to find an Ayurvedic physician, that's also like a plant-based physician, is there such a thing? There are a few, um, they, they are few and far between. There is, um, the woman that I mentioned who wrote that lovely, uh, Ayurvedic self-care handbook. If that's not the title I gave, that's the correct title. The Ayurvedic self-care handbook, Sarah Kuchera, K-U-C-E-R-A, is in practice. She is a doctor of chiropractic and she is a certified Ayurvedic practitioner. She is in Kansas City, Missouri, my hometown, uh, but she does telehealth and, and can work with people all over and she is vegan. Um, there is also a gentleman, and I'm going to have to give you his name, Chef AJ, and you can share it later, who is in LA, um, who is a plant-based uh, Ayurvedic um, consultant, and he is also um, uh, uh, fully, fully plant-based. I, I said that. I said it twice. It's late here. Uh, <laughs> and um, a, a, a physician, if you're looking for a, a Western internist who is also Ayurvedic, he's not vegan but perfectly understanding of vegans. And his name is Scott Gerson. He is in Dunedin, Florida. Um, I think his is uh, Gerson Ayurvedic um, Institute, Scott, G-E-R-S-O-N. And, and he is both a doctor of Ayurvedic trained in India as an Ayurvedic Vaidya, is what they call their doctors, but he's also a Mount Sinai trained internist. So if you're looking for somebody that uh, like that, He's, he's very, very, um, um, you know, willing to, to work with vegans. Nice. Uh, Angela says, what style of yoga do you teach and practice? Well, I, I don't teach at the moment, but I am certified to teach and I do classic Hatha yoga. So when I discovered yoga in, oh my gosh, it's going to make me seem so ancient, 1967, um, that was the only kind that had come to the West. So the kind of yoga that we did, the Hatha yoga, which was largely mat based, and we didn't have these little sticky mats like everybody uses now. We had nice thick mats. So when you're like doing a spinal roll, you're actually protecting your spine. And I always say to people on their little skinny mats, use two of them, use three of them, just really protect your bones. Cause once you've injured a, you know, a, a, a disc, you're, you're not gonna be able to, do a whole lot about that in any kind of easy way. So yeah, Hatha yoga, uh, which is taught uh, in this country at Integral Yoga and, and some other places, um, that's my style. <laughs> nice. Mary Ann says, what is the difference between vegan and vegetarian? Vegetarians don't eat anybody with a face or a mama and vegans don't eat anything that came from an animal. So that includes uh, eggs, dairy products, um, and, uh, and for most vegans, honey. Some, some vegans do choose to consume honey if they know where it came from. So it's used to be everybody was vegetarian first. You know, We all had our time of going out and eating lots of cheese omelets <laughs> before we made it to vegan. But now it's so clear that it's all of a piece that really, you know, certainly people need to do whatever they need to do to transition at, at their own pace. But there's really 
no reason for for us and certainly for the animals uh, to put it off. Uh, um, your body's been waiting for you to be vegan your whole life. <laughs> so now's a good time. Nice. And there's a question. If you are from Massachusetts. No, from no, I, but thank you. That's, that's a compliment. I've always been fascinated by new England. I always thought it was so classy. That's great. Oh, uh, Elizabeth says, can you use this knowledge for relationships to find the perfect match, whether friends <laughs> or romantic? I think it's not that you use it to find that person, but when you find somebody that you're interested in to find out what their dosha type is and be understanding of that. So I talked about my husband and, and the guy movies. He goes to see his guy movies by himself. I used to have a girlfriend who liked those kind of movies and they would just go together. And that was fine with me. I totally trusted him. I knew they weren't on a date, but you know, with somebody for him to enjoy this thing that he likes that I just can't handle being a Vata and just being myself. And so when you understand that the other person isn't trying to make you unhappy by turning the air conditioning down to 65 degrees, you can you know, come to some meeting of the minds and, uh, and have a really great relationship. I think that as relationship counseling, if a relationship gets serious, that people should really get their dosha thing uh, figured out it will lead to more harmony down the road. Nice. I don't know if I'm a true pitta because I'm always cold. Well, th this is when it gets a little bit tricky and that's why the quizzes are good or seeing an Ayurvedic doctor is, is, is good. So, um, it, but you know, sometimes something just comes to the fore. And even if you're like, let's just say you're uh, 70% Pitta and 60% Vata. The Vata is so volatile that that coldness of the Vata could override the heat of the Pitta. And so maybe you, maybe you, maybe we are not only astrological sisters, but dosha sisters, because you could be Vata Pitta too. Nice. I mean, I'd be happy to be your uh, dosha sister. Uh, Alex says, what imbalance does alopecia have to do with? I believe, and I, I'm not an expert on this. I'm not an Ayurvedic practitioner. I do this in my own life and, and share it uh, as, as needed. But um, my understanding is that that is pitta aggravation. And you can certainly do a little bit of, of research on that and, and see what you find. And, you know, so many conditions are not just dosha based. You know, there, there's so much going on with people. We're living in such an unhealthy state and in, in our planet, even when we eat really well and we exercise and we do everything that we're supposed to be doing, there's just a lot of toxicity out there that gets into us, even if we do our very best to, to keep it out. So um, it's wonderful to have Ayurveda as one resource if there's something going on that uh, you want to change, but just be open to everything because um, you want to find your answer. Great, thanks. And there's another question. I've been into superfoods like sea moss, moringa, spirulina. Are there any specific super good or superfoods, I'm guessing, for vata pita that you have learned? Oh, that's a really interesting question. I think that the spices that, that we talked about that um, are, are always good. You know, Ayurveda coming from India and coming from ancient India it is going to bring forward a lot of these cultural uh, traditions. And so the spices... And, and stirring up those spices, dry roasting them in, in a skillet, and then putting them in, into your dishes um, is believed to make the, the super properties uh, within those um, spices more readily available for, um, for your, your cooking. And Ayurveda as such, and again, this is a very ancient tradition. So they're not gonna be talking about stuff like superfoods. Um, 
they like very basic foods that, uh, that in Ayurveda, it's all about digestion. So sometimes you'll go to an Ayurvedic doctor and you'll be having digestive difficulties. And that person will recommend that you eat mostly kitchari. In fact, they do a cleanse that's just kitchari, which is basmati rice, uh, split mung dal or split lentils, the beans that are most easily digestible and vegetables of your choice, but only the kind of vegetables you can easily digest right now. If you get gas from cruciferous vegetables, the Ayurvedic doctor will say, don't eat those now. And I remember saying to an Ayurvedic doctor once who gave me this list of foods that she said I shouldn't be eating. And it had the foods that I just think are the healthiest in all the world, cabbage and kale and Brussels sprouts. And I said, well, this is ridiculous. These are such healthy foods. And she said something that I didn't really want to hear, but it was pretty wise. She said, no food is healthy that you can't digest. So it doesn't mean that you can never eat them. It just means that until your, your digestive apparatus is, is healed, you're, you are better off according to Ayurveda without them. Now, the Ayurvedic suggestion might well be to use white basmati rice. Mm -hmm. So you're, you come in, you're suffering with maybe constipation. And it's like, that goes against everything we've ever heard. All we hear is fiber, fiber, fiber for constipation. But the Ayurvedic view would be, if you're not digesting it, it, it's just going to sit there. And, and so you want to let, let your digestive apparatus heal. You don't want to be scratching it with roughage right now. And then once that's happened, and it doesn't take forever, then you bring back in more of the fiber and more of the gaseous foods and things like that. So I've gotten away from the, the question uh, about superfoods, but generally in Ayurveda, they're looking at ways to increase your agni, your digestive fire, so that you can digest. So something that you could probably count as a superfood is a ginger pickle. And a ginger pickle is something that Ayurveda suggests that you have before lunch and before dinner. And remember, we're going to have the biggest meal of the day midday, because that's when the fire is hottest. So to do ginger pickles, you slice your fresh ginger, you can just scrub it, you don't have to peel it, slice it thinly, but not so that if you pick it up, it would flop over, <laughs> you want it like a like a little wafer. And then you're going to soak these ginger slices in some lemon juice. And um, if you want to sprinkle a little turmeric, if you want to have a little tiny bit of salt in there, or just the lemon juice, and let, let those kind of soak for a couple of hours. And they'll last about five days in the fridge. And you just have two or three of these before meals, ideally 30 minutes before, but if that's a lot to think about, then just before. And, and that's a, a digestive tonic. Um, there's also a, a kind of tea, which is uh, cardamom, fennel, and cumin. And you have equal parts of cardamom seeds, fennel seeds, and cumin seeds. And you make a tea out of that. And that's also, I mean, super antioxidant, but really good for digestion as well. Great. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Susanna says, somebody who's brand new wants to learn more about this. Are there certain books or websites you could recommend? Sure. Um, I would definitely recommend the book, the Ayurvedic self-care handbook that I talked about before. And then Deepak Chopra's first book, you can still get it, but this goes, this is a 1990 book. He's revised it uh, since then. It's not a vegetarian book. So, you know, when he talks about animal products, you know, I just skip that part. But the, it's, it's a book about Ayurveda overall. And it's such a great resource. I have probably read it 25 times and it's called Perfect Health by Deepak Chopra. So those two are, are really good to start with. Nice. Oh, I want to thank Angela for the super chat donation. Thank you so much. And a couple of people are asking about autoimmune disease. So Gina says our autoimmune disease is a particular dosha. And Jojo says what dosha weaknesses affect the development of autoimmune diseases like Hashimoto's and type one diabetes? I have no idea. 
you, you would have to ask uh, an Ayurvedic physician or practitioner. Autoimmune is a very recent naming of collections of symptoms. And the idea that the body attacks itself is not something that has been known even in Western medicine for a very long time and certainly not in Ayurvedic medicine. So I think that Ayurveda would look at those symptoms as symptoms um, rather than necessarily um, putting them together under the autoimmune umbrella uh, that you would find in, in Western medicine. And I'm sorry that I don't know more. I'm, I'm just a girl that likes to be healthy. Uh, I'm not a doctor. My apologies. A few people are saying you resemble Mia Farrow. Ooh, well, thank you. I think she's gorgeous. So uh, that's very kind. So tell us how someone could become a Main Street Vegan Academy graduate. When the next class is, how would they register? Oh, you're so kind. The next class is in October. So we, uh, we're seven full days and it's very intense. Um, you have to read five books uh, be before you come or if you register late, you can read them during the course. Most of them are available on Audible. And um, then you just go to MainStreetVegan.net, click on Academy, or you could go to MainStreetVegan.net slash Academy and, and just read all about it. And if you have any questions, just get in touch with me, Victoria at MainStreetVegan.net. And I will give you the discount code since you're a friend of Chef AJ's and any friend of Chef AJ's is a friend of mine. And that code is kindness 20 with a capital K on kindness. And, and that will save you 20% uh, off your tuition. And as I say, we're gonna have our jazzy new website probably in, in two to three weeks. So uh, I hope everybody will wanna take a look at that too when the time comes. And, and you can sign up there um, at mainstreetvegan.net for my list. It will say, do you wanna be a Main Street Vegan? And then um, you know we'll have you on the list and you can, hear all sorts of cool things that are going on. You'll get the weekly blog, which I write uh, the first Tuesday of the month and Main Street Vegan Academy graduates write the rest of the time. For, for those people who take the course and who want to stay connected, it's a family. We're having a reunion this Saturday. They write the blog posts. I just heard this morning, one of our graduates who wrote a beautiful memoir called Oblivious, a vegan memoir about being a vegan empath. And she's one of these people that she so has a heart for the animals that she just really cannot be at a table where people are eating meat. And when I first heard about people like that, you know, having come through like you and I did, uh, Chef AJ, you know, the, the 80s, and it's like, you're not going to ever eat with anybody if, if you feel like that. But it's a real thing being such an empath. So she wrote this lovely book, Oblivious. And I just learned that it's going into an audible. Um, audiobook format. And one of our other graduates, who is a voiceover artist, is, is doing that for her. So there's just all sorts of, of wonderful getting together and, and helping one another after the fact. So uh, please read up. And if you're interested, you know, I, I'll just do whatever I can to help make sure you can, uh, you can come and uh, get your certification. And go out there and be even more of a superhero than you already are. And they can live anywhere now because they can do it virtually, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And I want to tell you about this amazing man who took our class, the, the last class that, that we had a couple of months ago. He lives in Sandu, Kenya. And I had been corresponding with him because he has a vegan support group there. He is a, a veganic farmer. And I suggested the academy and he really wanted to come but he said there is no wi-fi in my town so we arranged for him to be able to go to a bigger town on the weekends and do the course with the wi-fi there and he keeps sending me pictures and things so his group is bigger now and and they're meeting in this this school like gymnasium and he said that he goes around door to door to share the vegan message with people. 
And he says that the main thing he has to contend with is that people in his area believe that it must be of the devil. So he has to convince them that it's not. And, and you know, that it's about vegetables. So, you know, it's like I say, we have people from, from six continents and, and people have, uh, they're just out there doing amazing things. I'm so proud of them all. That's great. Well, you're going to be seeing at least six of them this week, yeah. starting tomorrow with Christine Day from Costa Rica, who's going to be making a tropical breakfast, which includes not only the fruits from Costa Rica, but waffles, vegan, of course. So that sounds yummy. So feel free to pop in all week if you like to introduce any of your graduates, if you have the time, just for a couple of minutes before they start their show. Thank you. I, I know a couple of days I cannot, but I'll come every day that I can. Right. And you can send another graduate on the days you can't. That I'll do my best. best. All right. Well, thank you so much, Victoria. Oh, thank you, Chef AJ. It's always a pleasure. And you know what? Whether you are a pitta or not, I caught some of your energy. And now when I go walk, my dog will go faster. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much. And thanks all of you for watching another episode. Please come back the rest of the week while we feature a different Main Street Vegan